All right. Hey, this is Doc Mike. I am here, uh, the redneck dentist here in Sheridan, Oregon. I just wanted to say thank you to Real Liberty Media for giving me an opportunity to do a show. And I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I don't know. I, I want to start out by saying I am not a professional at this for sure. Uh, hopefully I have everything set up right. I'm sure I'll get some feedback pretty soon if I don't. Uh, if there's nothing coming across the um, the uh, website. Anyway, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about what this show is going to be about in the future and what I'm going to talk about today, a little bit of an outline. I'll just tell you, <clears throat> I want to start out with my childhood a little bit. It was pretty unremarkable, really. Um, the only... I wanted to kind of get to my high school days. I don't really remember a whole lot about my real childhood, you know, grade school and junior high is probably typical stuff, uh, you know, formative years and teenage years. But I, this is what I was really remembering and I wanted to share with people. When I was in high school, uh, I just did my work. I mean, I wasn't remarkable. I wasn't, uh, didn't consider myself a brilliant student or anything like that. Uh, matter of fact, I have a sister who was supposedly like a lot smarter than I was. She was uh, like a year and a half ahead of me, so two years in school. And um, so I kind of followed in her footsteps. But she was, she was, uh, she was the smart one. She was like a genius. I just remember, even when I was a little kid, she was reading books. You know, when she was five or six years, I don't even know. But she was always a big reader, and I was kind of a I was just kind of a goofy kid, you know, just had fun playing outside and, uh, you know, playing street football or football in the fields or whatever. And uh, anyway, when I got close to uh, graduating, my uh, this counselor called me in, you know, high school counselor called me in. And I'm um, sorry, my cell phone. Oh, by the way, I'm just going to go back to this a little bit. You know, I'm doing this from a home studio, and you know what that means. I'm sitting at my desk, and I have two small dogs and a big dog and a cat, and, you know, I live in the country, so it probably won't be bothered by too much. But if a delivery person shows up or something like that, yeah, you're going to hear the dogs barking. And I don't have any music ready to go, so I could, you know, mute my mic and put that on. But maybe in the future I will. Anyway, so when I was in high school, uh, the counselor uh, called me in, you know, senior year. And they said, hey, uh, you know, what are you going to do after high school? And I was like, ah, I don't know, you know. I, I have no idea what I'm going to do. Uh, and she said, no, I mean, what college are you going to go to? And I was like blown away. I was like, well, what do you mean? What college am I going to go to? And she said, well, <laughs> you have to, you have to go to college. And I was like, why? And she said, well, you know, you've done really well in high school. And it was kind of the first I'd known about it. And I'll tell you why, because I didn't ever put any, I didn't ever, ever like, like look at my report card when it came in or. You know, I wasn't competing with other people in high school. I just wanted to kind of get my work done and go home. That was my goal every day. And and really my goal was to get my work done as soon as I could get it done so that I had lots of hours to play in the evening or goof off or do whatever it was I wanted to do. I didn't want to be tied down doing homework. Well, it turns out that that is... Um, you know, that that kind of made me sort of successful in high school. So the bottom line is this counselor asked me what college I was going to go to. I hadn't given it any thought whatsoever. But then it was like, oh, okay, well, gosh, I guess maybe I'll go to college, you know. Uh, um, I might have misspoke instead of high school. But anyway, so um, but I didn't have the money to go to college, and my parents didn't have the money to send me to college. Now, this was back in the late 70s which was kind of cool because at that time they still had the old GI Bill. I don't know if any of you are familiar with that, but uh, at that time, if you did four years of active duty service, you would get a monthly um, payment 
to attend college for about four years. I think it was four years. Anyway, so, uh, you know, I applied to some colleges and, you know, thought, you know, if I got accepted to colleges, I would maybe consider going and, um, you know, figure out a way to pay for it somewhere along the way. Well, anyway, so I, I didn't mean for to go this far far into the story, but I might as well complete it. So this is what happened. I got accepted to every college that I applied to. And of course, the closest college was University of Oregon, because at the time I was living in Springfield, Oregon, which is close to Eugene, where University of Oregon is. So I got accepted. And, uh, you know, they have like this freshman uh, orientation day. And I was going to go, or I went to the freshman orientation day, and I'm telling you, man, for a 18-year-old kid who was kind of um, pretty naive about the world in general, it was flipping overwhelming, <laughs> I'll tell you. I mean, they had you going from one place to another to meet people from, you know, this department or that department, try and get you to decide what classes you're going to take and what you know, what field you were going to study and a bunch of stuff. It, it was it was kind of overwhelming for me. And not only that, but because I didn't really have any idea what I wanted to do, it made me feel a little lost. So right across the street at that time, okay, let's say within a few blocks of the University of Oregon was the, you know, the military center where they have all the recruits. So I went down. I went directly from the um, freshman uh, indoctrination day or whatever they call that to the uh, recruiters and I took a couple tests. I, I don't know. I can't remember. I think I went to Air Force and the Coast Guard and, uh, you know, of course I did pretty good on their exams and I went home and uh, it was kind of funny. I told my mom, she said, she said, well, how did your you know, freshman initiation day go. And I said, oh, I said, it was pretty good. I said, but um, but I actually enlisted in the U.S. Coast Guard. <laughs> and she thought I was kidding. And um, it kind of took her by surprise. And she said, well, don't I have to sign anything or anything like that? And I was like, no, you know, I'm 18. You know, I just uh, went and took the test and you know, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go off to boot camp and do something. I don't know what. So uh, that was my initial uh, introduction to college. Was one day of their introduction to the University of Oregon, and I went off to uh, enlist in the U.S. Coast Guard. And let me tell you. So my the only reason I'm kind of going into this is because I want everybody to have a history kind of see where I came from so as we go along in future episodes you'll kind of know me a little bit I am loaded with stories so hopefully you like a little storytelling along the way too so anyway uh, I went into the Coast Guard went to their boot camp in uh, Alameda California that was in 76 and uh, after boot camp I was just a regular enlisted guy I went to, let's see, out of boot camp, where did I go? Oh, I went to uh, Juneau, Alaska on a motor lifeboat station, uh, actually out of Ock Bay, Alaska, and that was awesome. Alaska was just an incredible place to go and visit and live. I was there for about a year. I put in for a school called Electrician's Mate School um, and became an electrician, and this is the reason why I did that because I knew absolutely nothing about electricity and I thought hey while I'm in the service if I'm gonna have some kind of a skill I might as well have a skill that I have absolutely no clue what's going on so I became an electrician went to their electrician school in Governor's Island New York and um, I was graduated about the top of the class I think it was number three or something in that class, maybe number four. It doesn't matter. You all just end up going to work. Anyway, so out of there, I went to a Coast Guard cutter in Port Angeles, Washington. And I was there for, I think, a year, maybe 
I think about a year, and um, I had put in for another duty assignment, and I got assigned to a little uh, a little uh, Coast Guard buoy tender in Lake Union, Washington, and that buoy tender was 65 feet long, and it has 60-foot barge cabled to the front of it. Uh, it was really kind of cool because 65 feet, you can imagine, there's not a huge crew on that. There was like six or eight of us, depending up on if we were fully staffed or not. But the kind of uncool part about that is uh, when there's only six or eight of you, you all end up doing all of the work. <laughs> you know, there's not there's not a crew full of people to you know, chip the paint off the boat and sand it and repaint it. And uh, like everybody has to pitch in and do their part, which was kind of cool because what we did was we maintained navigational aids in the Puget Sound area, which if you've ever been up to and around Seattle, you know it's just a beautiful, beautiful area up there. And there's lots of inland waterways that need to be navigated. And, you know, we made it safe for um, ships to navigate. So that was cool. But um, getting to the dental part, uh, as I neared the end of my career in the Coast Guard, my four years active duty, I was <laughs> trying to decide what I was going to do in life. And uh, my girlfriend at the time, she was a dental assistant, and um, uh, she was she would talk to me about going to college and becoming a dentist, and I was like, eh, oh, yeah, I mean, I guess it sounds okay. I don't know. I wasn't really sold on the idea at first. But one day on that Coast Guard buoy tender, we were out up in the San Juan Islands, which is also beautiful, but it happened to be really crappy weather, just like, you know, rain, cold, fog. And we were kind of moored next to a, let's basically call it a rock. And we, our job was to pour concrete on this rock in a form that we could mount uh, navigational aid to and it's a light you know it's either a green or red light or whatever you know and we so we had to pour the concrete and um, you know make a form and mount the navigational aid to it and put the batteries in they were, they all use some kind of batteries with a an optional power supply and I just remember thinking that day I was like I am miserable. It is freaking cold, rain, I'm soaked, it's freezing, we're hauling, mixing and hauling concrete in buckets to <laughs> pour this foundation. And like I said, there's only six or eight of us on the ship. One of them had to hold, hold, the, uh, hold the ship where it was, you know, and then somebody had to be manning the mixer and, you know, the rest of us were, you know, hauling concrete. And I was thinking to myself, you know what, that wouldn't be a bad idea to be a dentist. I'd be, I'd be indoors pretty much all the time in a nice controlled environment, fairly clean, you know, uh, depending on how, what you think about dentistry. Uh, you know, it is one of those places in the body that are actually pretty dirty to work in but uh but the environment's generally clean so that's when i kind of made the decision yeah i think i'll become a dentist who is out there in the san juan islands pouring concrete on a rock <laughs> so anyway um let's see there's a kind of long history i had in the um uniform services so I was in the Coast Guard uh, active duty from 76 to 80. I stayed in the reserves from 80 to 89. I went to the U of O from 1980 to 84, and then Oregon Health Sciences University from 84 to 88. And I didn't know this, but when you become a, uh, when you achieve a doctorate in medicine or dentistry or law, and you're enlisted, they no longer let you stay enlisted, <laughs> at least at the time they didn't. 
And so I took an honorable discharge from the U.S. Coast Guard, and I took a commission in the U.S. Public Health Service. Now, that's going to that's gonna come up uh, later that I actually served in the U.S. Public Health Service from 1989 to 2005. It's going to be important because of some of the stuff we're going through right now with COVID and that being a public health issue. I actually made air quotes. Luckily, we don't have a stream. It probably looked really stupid. But uh, I, I, I had a, a really awesome career. I retired as a commander, or 05, uh, from the U.S. Public Health Service in 2005. And then I started working basically for other people. Uh, as a dentist, uh, companies or dental service organizations. And I had my own office for about five years. That was really interesting. I learned a lot of stuff. I learned to do implants on people, which is really uh, the state of the art for replacing teeth these days. It's, I, I believe the standard of care for replacing teeth these days. And if you need a tooth replaced, I would definitely consider doing it. It may seem expensive. I know it's expensive, you know, but... It is the most permanent way to replace a tooth and a very awesome way to do it. Um, anyway, so that kind of brings us up to today. And uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about being a redneck dentist. I, I've always, it's kind of funny. So I go to my job every day. Um, I'm, I, I guess I'm sort of professional when I'm at my job. I like to have fun. I like to put people at ease, but uh, I, but I am a dentist. I provide a professional service. But outside of that, man, I have a little five acre. Um, my home is on five acres. We own the house. We've we've had different animals. We have chickens now. We used to have goats. We used to have horses. Uh, I had rabbits. I mean, I've done all different kind of things to produce food and to make sure that we weren't you know, reliant on somebody else to pro to provide our food here, uh, and you know, and I do some I do some stuff that's pretty redneck at times. You know, if I have to fix something on the spot, it's not going to be a real professional fix. It's going to be you know, uh, duct tape and bailing wire or whatever I can get my hands on, and uh, you know, a lot of times that works out, and sometimes it doesn't. But uh, but that's uh, that's and and my I guess that's what I'm saying is I live in the country I work in the country. Um, the population I serve some of them have you know don't have any money, uh, and the people who have some money I want to give them the best service I can for that money, and I'm not one of those guys who's always like looking to make the most amount of money from them I've I've never really been that way. Uh, I always try and give people the most the most service for their money or the best deal for their money because I didn't have money for a long time and I know what it's like and uh and I expect the same thing I expect when I pay money for something that I'm going to get the most for my buck so anyway uh so this show in the future is we're going to talk about Food. We're going to talk about gathering food or growing food or obtaining food or storing food. <laughs> I'm kind of a food nut, and I, but I want to say I'm not really a health food nut. In fact, today for um, breakfast, I had a country fried steak with gravy and a fried egg on it. And before that, before my breakfast, I had a cinnamon roll. So um, just so we all understand, I am not the guy who is going to talk about being extremely healthy. Now, I do try and stay in shape. Uh, I have my bicycle is attached to a training you know, mechanism or mount that uh, provides some resistance. So you basically call it spinning I guess but uh, I try and get a half an hour to four, 45 minutes of you know cardiac work in every day uh, and I do kind of watch how much I eat but not so much what I eat is healthy if you know what I mean 
So I might have really fattening food, but I try and limit how much I have. Okay, so uh, did I lose my place? Oh, so we're going to be talking about, um, we'll probably talk about some hunting. We'll probably talk about fishing. We'll talk about gathering stuff at the beach. Um, we'll talk about trapping, because believe it or not, I, I didn't even know this, I, but about 10, 15 years ago, uh, somebody mentioned trapping to me in Oregon, and I was like, you can trap in Oregon? <laughs> I mean, you grow up in this society where everybody kind of uh, makes everything seem either illegal or Ill immoral, and you don't realize that you can actually still trap critters. You can trap critters, and there's actually a need for it. And in Oregon, one of the things that I learned to do, well, let me say first, I wasn't a great trapper. I was a mediocre trapper at best. But um, people who have nuisance animals uh, interfering with their life in one way or another, whether it be skunks under their in their crawl space or possums or coons eating their chickens or whatever, they need somebody to come and get that animal and remove it. And in Oregon, you could actually become like a licensed um, nuisance uh, animal uh, nuisance control officer which meant um, you were licensed to remove nuisance critters so I actually went through that whole process and learned how to do it when I say learned how to do it I mean I learned how to answer the questions correctly so I could get the license it took me a long time to figure out how to be a good trapper. And like I said, I was not a good trapper. I was mediocre at best. But uh, in most cases, when I was called out on a nuisance job, I was pretty successful. Um, so we're going to talk about uh, different ways to obtain food. And, it, you know, I know in this day and age, you know, with uh, the way that we uh, we the federal government is spending money there's a lot of talk about whether we're going to enter some hyperinflation but you know that that's coming at some point like you know you can't continue to print money the way that we've been printing money and there be no repercussion for that so I hope that uh, as we talk about surviving and providing for yourselves that we you know, kind of make people feel more comfortable about um, about obtaining food, either growing it, uh, killing it, you know, getting it yourself, or raising it if it's uh, if it's animals. And um, I have some limited experience with all that stuff. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you, I was listening to another show a few nights ago, like two nights ago, and it was all about. Uh, self-preparedness and the person who was talking had way more information than I do about you know what they think uh, the um, what they think is going to happen with the um, you know with the finances in this country and I always listen to a show when I go to bed at night because I have this background noise and it makes me go to sleep and this damn show got me so wound up and I told my I told my wife the next day, I was like, hey, uh, that was the wrong show to listen to because all I could do is lay there in bed and think about all the stuff I needed to get going again because it seems to me like, I don't know, 10 or 20 years ago, we kind of went through this thing and I and I started up a, a rabbit tree and we produced rabbits and we had chickens and we had goats and I would breed the goats so that I always had a, a pregnant goat to get goat milk and we had we would breed that dairy goat uh, female with a meat goat male to make um, you know to make meat goats so we could actually um, produce some meat on the property here. Um, you know it's not something everybody could do, but it was something that we could do at the time. And actually, goats are pretty a pretty manageable critter. Uh, so we're going to be talking about obtaining food, trapping, hunting. Um, you're going to hear me probably often talk about uh, sprouts. 
and I'm going to talk a little bit about it right now. And the reason I'm going to talk about it is because it's kind of amazing when you think about it. Uh, and I'm not talking about the sprouts that you buy in the store in that little square or, you know, that's usually how I see them. They're in like a little pint cardboard square and it's always alfalfa sprouts and that's awesome. You know, I get it. That That's really great. But that's not what I'm talking about because you can grow sprouts so easily at home. And like I said, I'm not a health food nut, but this just makes sense. So listen, uh, and I'll go into this in much greater detail in a future episode. But imagine that you have some quantity of seeds of all different kinds. I, for example, like a mix of bean sprouts, and I actually get like three different um I, I actually get three different kind of beans, uh, azuki, beans, mung beans, and lentils. Uh, those three I sprout together. And I always like to add a little salad mix, which is a radish sprout, um, broccoli sprout, and alfalfa sprout. And and I make a, I sprout them all together, so it's just a blend of sprouts. But the bean sprouts have some protein in them, and the rest of the sprouts have you know, nutrition. And here's what I, why I think it's kind of a, an amazing food to get used to growing. And that even if you don't like vegetables, there's still a ton of nutrition in the sprouts. And the only thing you need to make that seed give you nutrition is water. And I literally mean all you need is water. What's amazing with the seeds that sprout is that they already contain all the information that they need to produce all those nutrients that they produce in the adult plant. And when you grow sprouts and um, harvest them, you're just eating a miniature adult plant, basically. It has leaves. It has roots. Um, it, it's already a little nutrition-making factory. So it's something I strongly believe in because it's so easy. It doesn't take a lot of space to store a bunch of seed. Um, you can get organic seed that is not GMO'd. It's not been mani manipulated or touched by uh, Monsanto, who, of course, I hate. Um they're just good organic seeds, and you can get a hold of those pretty easily. And just imagine a pound of dry um, seeds, no matter what kind you get, are just not going to take up a lot of space. And I always grow, I can tell you, I grow um, two tablespoons of bean sprouts and like a teaspoon of the salad mix, the, the broccoli, alfalfa, and radish Um uh, I'll, I'll grow those in four or five days. And uh, so anyway, that's that's the amount you need, like two tablespoons, two, two, two and a half tablespoons, let's say, of seed will make enough sprouts to keep you alive easily for days, but to actually provide you nutrition for for some days. Like once those sprouts are sprouted and ready to eat, you know, you can have them on a sandwich. You can put them in a salad. I like to just pinch some right off, right off out of the dish that I grow them in, and eat them. They're just good. Um, and I wasn't ever a real crazy uh, vegetable lover in the first place, but it just, you know, as, I think as you get older, um, you realize uh, there's some of those uh, nutritional things that are really important. And then, like for survival too, you know, I like to think of uh, food that's easy for people to grow if they have to. Like, I mean, it wouldn't cost you a lot to put some, um, to go buy some bean uh, sprouting seeds from a company. I like a company called, well, they used to be called Wheatgrass Kits, but now they're called something, oh, now they're called True Leaf. Uh, and I'll put that link in my show notes. So if you uh, look up my show notes later, I don't know how that happens, but 
Um, oh, it'll be a blog post, I'll bet. I'll, I'll put their link in the blog post, and uh, you'll be able to just go uh, click on that and go shopping. Because you could put a pound of seeds away. I don't care if you didn't even grow them right now, but if, you know, look what happened in Texas. Not that they could probably grow sprouts during that freeze, <laughs> but... You know, if they had, I mean, they probably could. If you were desperate, you'd figure out a way to um, provide yourself some food. You could break those seeds out. You could start a fire, get some warm water, you know, try and keep your seeds warm while they're, in, you know, keep them from freezing. I know there's probably a lot better things to do in the situation that uh, most of those Texans were in. And actually, I guess most of the rest of the country was in during that big freeze a week or so ago. Um, but, you know, when that happened, you know, the, the, um, the supply chain to the stores, it comes to a screeching halt because there's no traffic moving. And, you know, there's a four-day supply of groceries in most stores. That's it. So, uh, you know, and usually that runs out the first day everybody re realizes they're going to be in a huge uh, a huge disaster. There's going to be a huge shortage. Uh, what I never understood is why everybody ran out and bought toilet paper when they figured out there was a COVID crisis, supposedly, because um, it didn't cause you to have diarrhea as far as I know or anything like that but man that shortage of toilet paper caused a big issue anyway so um so I'm just going to be kind of an advocate this is a really this is a really uh easy way to store some future nutrition and if things get really tough, it's a good way to help you kind of survive for a little bit of time till you figure out what else is going on. And it's also just great food, you know, a lot of nutrition packed in sprouts. Uh, let's see what else I have on my list. Oh, yeah. I have a couple of apologies to make right away. I live in Oregon. And I even heard earlier this week, it's like one of the top, I don't know, three like liberal states in the nation. And I'm sorry. <laughs> We're not all like that here in Oregon. Trust me. It just so happens that the major cities in Oregon, well, that's where the most concentrated population is and they run most of the state and we have a gigantically bad rap I guess if you don't like you know liberal politics well this that's what we are but we are definitely not all like that you know most of the outlying communities uh, most of the outlying counties especially farmland and ranch land and uh, those people out there making money uh, outside of the city are not so uh, liberal, that's for sure. Okay, man, I talked a long time without a break. I'm going to take a little drink. Hang on. I guess I could mute my mic when I do that too. But uh, I wanted to tell you this story about Oregon. I'm, I have a different, I have another story I want to tell you later. Uh, I am going to get a little bit political at times. Uh, um, so the, uh, the one story I wanted to talk about, just as an example for Oregon specifically. So in the last week, our elected officials have got together and l listen to how crazy this is. About, uh, I guess during the last election cycle, uh, Oregon decided and I don't mean the voters of Oregon, although I guess it was on a ballot at some point. Anyway, they decided to, I'm not going to say legalize drugs, but they decided to make the penalty extremely um, small for what was previously considered illegal drugs. So if you have a certain amount of heroin, uh, methamphetamine, cocaine, whatever on your person 
uh, I think the maximum fine right now is $100, but you can actually, like, listen to some, uh, I don't know, rehab seminar or something, website, and you'll get that taken off. Okay, so that, I mean, I'm, o I'm kind of okay with, I should say this. I think you should be able to do whatever you want to do with your life as long as it doesn't affect other people, as long as it doesn't harm other people. So the legalizing part of the drug thing, eh, okay. I mean, I guess it's okay. I, I don't feel real strongly one way or the other about it. Uh, It'll be interesting to see what happens now as far as people either getting healthier or continuing to uh, take drugs and or abuse drugs if they're abusers. I mean, that's their choice. But here's the really crazy thing. So Oregon decided to legalize those previously illegal drugs. Now, they currently have uh, bills in the House and Senate that are going to increase taxes on alcohol by, uh, in, for wine, it's going to increase the tax on alcohol in Oregon by 2,000%, and on spirits, 7,000%. And the reason that they want to increase tax on alcohol is so that they can pay for the rehab of the people who are addicted to the previously illegal drugs. Now, I, I don't know. I, I haven't really put my finger on why this seems so stupid to me, but I can tell you this, I also find this kind of amazing. For, what, 50 years we have tried to basically make smoking illegal. You know, the, we've taxed it almost beyond people's means to afford it, number one. We've caused smokers to have to go outside far away from anybody else to smoke. Hell, in some places you can't even smoke in your own home or the place you live, especially if you rent or lease that place. Uh, uh, you can't smoke in hotels. You know, you can't smoke anywhere. I mean, basically, we've made smoking, you know, prohibited, except now we have, and a lot of states have legalized marijuana and are legalizing marijuana, and there's no... No, like, there's no, uh, okay, I won't say there's no restriction on which form of cannabis you, you are allowed to use. But what I'm saying is, why do you make, like, smoking tobacco, you know, so prohibitive, but then turn around and legalize cannabis, which is kind of the, one of the favorite ways people um partake of cannabis is by smoking it. You know, it, it kind of doesn't make sense to me that, you know, the same people who basically outlaw smoking encourage the use of cannabis. Like, they didn't say, hey, let's legalize cannabis, but only in uh, forms that you eat or vape or whatever. No, they, they want you to smoke it too. I mean, you know, and it's funny that I guess probably some, uh, depending on where you live, some of the same rules apply to smoking uh, cannabis as apply to smoking cigarettes. But my point is, is like, um, you know, they're, so they're trying to get people to quit smoking cigarettes because it's so horrible for you. And actually, any, um, any, uh, green leafy or I should say any biological plant material that you burn contains the same carcinogens, similar carcinogens. 
So it's not like smoking cannabis is healthier. I mean, although in some ways I think it is, and there's been plenty of medicinal uses uh, pointed out uh, pointed out from cannabis and for a long history, maybe thousands of years too. But uh, it just doesn't make sense to me. Uh, it seems to me you should you should allow people to do you know what they want to do as long as they don't harm anybody else. Um, let's see. Okay, so that was my kind of rant on Oregon. So some of the stuff you're going to hear me talk about is going to be Oregon-based politics for sure. But I'm going to go, you know, I have stuff that I want to say about, you know, national politics too, especially, you know, stuff that I think affects me and, uh, or maybe everybody, I don't know. Or maybe something that, some things that you don't know or... I don't know, maybe just the way I think about things. I'll give you an example. So, uh, of course, I think a lot of people understand that the that the um, that the end of Trump's presidency and the whole uh, mob at the Capitol, uh, you know, it's being referred to as an insurrection. And I got to tell you, like I listened to these politicians whine and cry about being scared and I, I I thought it was laughable that they were scared and it and it reminded me of um, what Thomas Jefferson said that um, uh, when the government fears the people you have liberty but when the people fear the government you have tyranny and I thought to myself you know that's the thing if you people actually fear feared the people if you actually thought for a minute that if you continue doing what you're doing until the people have had enough if you actually knew that you would push people to the point that they will come and hunt you down you might take your job a little more seriously. You might take your decisions a little more seriously. I want the government to be afraid of the people. You know what those people did? They went and took a tour of the Capitol. That's, in my opinion, that's what they did. Yeah, they may have done it by force. Yeah, some people got hurt. I'm sorry that some people got hurt. That was not an insurrection. If that was an insurrection, there would have been a lot more bodies on the ground and it wouldn't have been the people who were storming the building. There would have been that that would have been a lot worse than what it was. Um and for those people to now be barricaded, I guess I don't even know if the uh if the uh, barbed wire and fencing is still up, but it wouldn't surprise me a bit. But so now so now they think um, it's a good idea to have a fence up. So maybe maybe now they are really, nah, it won't happen that fast. But they do need to fear the people. I think that that's something that's going to be important in the future. Um, I, my, someone just started, my wife started to walk in. I was wondering what she was checking on. But anyway... Um, yeah, I, I just thought that was a good idea. Uh, I was glad to see politicians actually fear the people. You know, when, uh, when I was talking about that, that, um, quote from Thomas Jefferson, I was thinking of something somebody told me a long time ago. I, not, it wasn't that long ago. In the last couple months, we were talking about, uh, books and somebody told me, they said, Oh no, I was listening to somebody and they said, do you know that the if you're reading a book on an electronic reader, do you know that you don't own that book? And I, I was thinking, well, you paid for it. It's on your reader. But here's the thing is I heard that they can edit books to change. So if you're connected to the internet and they want to change some part of a book, that they can do that, and you you kind of don't have an option. Now, I know that if you download the book and then don't connect to the Internet again, that that, uh, that book would not change because you wouldn't expose it to the Internet where it could be edited. 
But what what I was thinking of is even that quote that I had from Thomas Jefferson. I mean, maybe someday that's going to disappear. I mean, you notice how the cancel culture is working now. They're just erasing um, historical figures from, you know, from people's sight and from popular um, parks and capitals and uh, institutions. And they're just kind of getting rid of them. And... Uh, it it kind of makes me worry in this day and age when everything is electronic or as everything becomes electronic. Um, that stuff can disappear so easily. I was talking to somebody, I think some of my coworkers this week, and I was like, you know, I don't even know, I don't even know you guys' phone number. I don't even know your number because my phone automatically dials the number. And I don't, I remember when I was much younger, you know, traveling around, you better remember everybody's phone number because if you got stuck out and about somewhere and you had to go to a pay phone, <laughs> you know, which a lot of people don't even know what that is today, um, you had to have their number in your head and you'd remember people's phone number uh, just in association with their name. And God, it's kind of terrifying right now. I mean, if... Uh, if all of a sudden we lost that ability to use our phone so automatically to dial numbers, uh, holy cow, I think there's only maybe a couple people I would be able to call or find somehow because I don't know their numbers. You know, I don't have them written down anywhere. I, I know there's ways you can do it. Of course, most of them involve Google or uh, Apple or whoever, uh, you know, I guess you could probably copy and print your, actually print out on paper your phone book, but you better do that before anything happens and keep it in a safe place too. Okay, let's see, what topics do I have left? I know I was going to talk about, uh, well, and I did kind of talk about the cancel culture a little bit, uh, us the people versus them, the elites in government. Uh, I I don't. Uh, oh, my cat is in here now. See, I told you there'll be a, there'll be some interruptions from time to time. She's just kind of prowling around though. She'll be okay. She's a Bengal cat, beautiful cat, by the way. Uh, let's see. Okay, how much time I got left? I have about 13 minutes. I don't know. We're gonna go ahead and get into this. Uh, let's. Oh, we did cover that. Okay. All right. Two topics I have left. Let's go with... Um, man, I have this topic <laughs> on genital, genital mutilation. Uh, I do kind of want to talk about this a little bit. Um, okay, so... Let's see, that means I would save that for next week. You know what? I think I'm going to save genital genital mutilation for next week uh, because it's kind of a deep subject and there's a lot of information about it. So let's kind of get the top, go to this topic about uh, female or shall we, shall we say transgender athletes. And I don't know if you've seen this story yourself. I didn't. I wasn't aware of it when it was actually a story, um, when it was actually active, which I guess was a couple of years ago. But it turns out there is a, an MMA fighter, mixed martial arts fighter, that was, air quotes again, transgender. Uh, she was fighting females in mixed martial arts but she was born a male and I have my own kind of really maybe corrupt thought about this particular athlete or about maybe some men in general who would do this and actually I kind of remember way back in the day maybe 25 years ago when people really started talking about transgender 
um, assignment, you know, and having the surgeries. And I'm sure it's been long, been around longer than that. But it seems like there was a time period in my life. And by the way, I'm 63, just in case anybody wonders, uh, is wondering. Um, I'm 63 years old, so I've been around since uh, 1957. Uh, but anyway, so it seems to me that there was a time period when all of a sudden, you know, transgender, you know, uh, um, sexual assignment became a deal and people started thinking about it. And the funny thing was at the time, I remember some of my uh, male friends and co-workers were talking about, because I think at, at the kind of around the same time there were you know, and I mean, we've been talking about equality for women for a long time, but it really kind of was one of those issues that was getting, you know, stronger and stronger and more popular. People were talking about uh, women getting paid more and having more opportunities, um, you know, uh, uh, climbing the corporate ladder, uh, taking on more responsibility and being able to do all the jobs that men could do, right? So, I even remember some of my male friends or co-workers at the time saying, well, you know, I could just have that, um, um, you know, sexual reassignment surgery, become a transgender, and I'd be a woman, and I would be able to keep compete for those jobs, but I'd be given preference because I'm a woman. Now, I mean, I think that's pretty effed up thinking myself. <laughs> Personally, I don't think I would ever want to compromise my my current uh, gender uh, just for a job somewhere since usually you're going to get screwed at your job anyway one way or the other. Maybe that wasn't the right term to use. Sorry, I got to get another drink. But here's what I was thinking. So what if, and this is my dark, corrupt, place in my brain. So what if that transgender person, MMA fighter, was a woman hater in the first place? Like, for whatever reason, just hated women. And they decided, you know what, I'm going to have this gender reassignment surgery, and then I'm going to go in boxing or MMA or whatever just so I can beat the hell out of women. <laughs> now, there, I don't know how somebody could do that, but when you think about it, why would you have gender reassignment and then go into a combat sport to beat the hell out of somebody and you kind of have to know that you probably have an advantage there you know I've had women tell me before that you know because I I'll tell you another story sometime uh, that is kind of probably way too personal but um but there was a woman in my life th that, who was horribly abused, uh, sexually and physically abused. And so I am concerned for people in my life. I don't like anybody to be abused or to have to suffer through some kind of abuse like that and the trauma that comes with it. So, I, you know, I've had talks with some of my female friends and said, Okay, well, you're going so-and-so or going wherever. Just be careful, you know, keep an eye out, you know, watch your back. And, you know, I don't know how many of them have said to me, oh, I, you know, I can handle this, you know, I, I can handle myself all right. And I think to myself, man, you have no idea the difference between men and women when it comes to violence and strength and just maybe... I don't know, pure evil. I'm not saying that women can't be. I'm just saying, man, I, I, I've, I've seen women lose some of those battles, and it's, it's not good. It's never good. So anyway, um, 
so so the, here's the whole reason I brought that story up, the female MMA fighter, is because I don't know if you've seen who the um, nominee for the Assistant Secretary of Health and Human Services is. And let me get her name right. Oh, yeah, Rachel Levine. And I don't know if you've seen her. She's transgender. And next week, we are going to talk about um, some of the things that she believes in and why you will see why that one of my topics is going to be genital mutilation. And I know that probably doesn't sound very pleasant, and it's not. But it's interesting how the world turns. And if you just change that terminology a little bit, all of a sudden it becomes, you know, something that's acceptable to some societies and some cultures somewhere. So let me um, go back over, kind of review here a little bit. Man, thanks so much for sticking with me for almost an hour now. Uh, it has been very fun. Uh, there was something I was thinking about. God, I hate that when I think on the fly. Oh, I will tell you this. I do have some uh, OCD tendencies, uh, you know, and I know that some of my staff would tell you that uh, I definitely have some of those tendencies, and I get distracted real easily, <laughs> and if I don't write something down, like, right away, I will forget, uh, And but I, I'll come back to it. As I'm reviewing these notes today, I know I will uh, come back to it. I, I really didn't know how much to prepare for an hour uh, show, but it looks like we pretty much covered it. Um, I Let me just check. I wanted to tell you something. Oh, I did want to tell you this part. So I say, you know, I'm uh, a redneck, the redneck dentist, okay? But I'm not, this is what kind of redneck I'm not. Um, I do own cowboy boots, but I'm not a cowboy. And I have a real nice Stetson hat, but I'm still not a cowboy. I'm not from the South. I'm not from Texas. Uh, I was born and raised in Oregon. I've seen a lot of the country, as I'll probably tell you in different uh, in different shows, like how um, oh, I've lived all over. I've lived in Pennsylvania. I've lived in Florida, Montana, Alaska. Uh, I, you know, being in the service, whether it doesn't matter kind of which branch of the service you're in, you kind of get to move around a lot. And I had a great career, uh, had a lot of fun, and I made promotions because I was willing to move. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not, you know, whatever kind of redneck you may have formed in your mind, I'm not probably, I don't have a big rodeo buckle, although I think they're pretty impressive. Uh, I don't have a horse. Um... I, I probably will say y'all once in a while, but I, I don't really say it that often. And uh, I just want to thank you all for listening. Um, I'm probably going to sign off now. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a doctor. I just play one on TV. No, okay, I'll tell you, I actually am a real dentist. <laughs> and we'll get into that later, too. Anyway, hey, thank you all for listening, and I will see you next week. <laughs>